Thank you. I, I know you're thinking, how does Alter deserve to be on the Nobel stage with brilliant minds like Michael Houghton and Charlie Rice? Meanwhile, I'm thinking, who are Michael Houghton and Charlie Rice? And why are they taking two thirds of my prize money? So life is all a matter of perspective. And today I wanna to give you a perspective of the beginning of hepatitis C discovery. This is a picture of intimate contact on the left in the time of COVID. Uh, on the right is a new international flag uh, that was initiated in 2020. COVID has changed everything as you know and because of COVID, I'm giving this talk at NIH rather than my adopted city of Paris. And I'm very sad uh, not to be there as I'm sure most of you are. I wanna start with this slide that was sent to me uh, as a congratulatory note uh, by Paul Pokros and Ann Pokros. And I thought it was extremely fitting and said, there is no elevator to success. You have to take the stairs. What I'm going to do today in a very abbreviated presentation is show you the steps that have led to this piece of the success story. It began uh, around 1970 and the first step was to determine through prospective studies the incidence of post-transfusion hepatitis. And remarkably, that incidence was around 30%, incredibly high rate. Uh, and the next step was to see why that rate was so high. And the first finding by John Walsh and others was that the main cause of this inordinately high rate was not only the large number of units received about an average of 17 units per patient as shown in the box, but the source of the blood. And if one received at least one unit of commercial or paid donor blood, there was a 51% chance you would develop hepatitis, whereas if you received only volunteer donor blood, that risk fell to 7%. So in 1970, we went to the next step. We introduced an all volunteer donor system and simultaneously introduced the first test for hepatitis B surface antigen. And you see that caused a precipitous fall from 33% down to around 10%. In 1973, uh, Abbott Laboratories developed a more sensitive test for hepatitis B surface antigen. And we went back into stored samples and surprisingly found that of the total hepatitis, only about 25, at most 30%, was due to the hepatitis B virus, and that there was some new non-B entity or some other non-B entity. In 1975, Feinstone, Kapitkin, and Purcell, shown from your right to left, uh, discovered the hepatitis A virus. And since they were collaborators of ours, we immediately sent them samples from our non-B cases and found that not a single one was due to hepatitis A. And it's then that we brilliantly deduced that if these cases were not A and were not B, we would call them non-A, non-B. We didn't call it hepatitis C at the time because we had not proven that we had a transmissible agent and because we didn't know how many agents might be involved. That led to the very next important step, and that was the chimpanzee model. Using the chimp model, which was uh, allowed at that time and did not, uh, chimps developed ALT elevations, but did not develop clinical hepatitis and usually no serious chronic sequelae. Uh, but the important point was that we could transmit to the chimps from patients either with acute or chronic non a non b hepatitis or from totally asymptomatic blood donors who had been implicated in a case of hepatitis transmission. 
The next critical phase was finding a patient during the acute phase of severe non-A, non-B hepatitis. This is our famous patient H became the prototype of non-A, non-B hepatitis. Shown here in blue are the ALT elevations, which began to rise between five and six weeks post-transfusion, rose to a peak of 2,111, uh, 112 rather, uh, and then began to subside. Importantly in this slide is we obtained an apheresis unit, 500 ml plasma at point A on the ascending limb of the ALT curve. And shown on the right-hand top panel, we were able to transmit hepatitis using that particular sample. Uh, Bob Purcell then did an infectivity titer on this H, what we call the H77 sample, and showed it had a chimp infectious dose of one times 10 to the 6.5. Later on, many years later on, when PCR came around, uh, we did a PCR titer on that same point A and showed that the uh, level was three times 10 to the seven copies per ml, or almost identical to the chimp infectious doses. As you can see in the yellow line, the HCV RNA level then began to decline rapidly, followed by a decline in the ALT. The patient went on to chronic uh, persistent hepatitis uh, with which he lived for 30 years when he died of an intercurrent illness. Uh, but now we had two things. We had an infectious inoculum that was titered and we had the chimp model. Then uh, Steve Feinstone uh, did chloroform extraction studies and Li Fang He did uh, filtration studies and we showed that the virus, this non-A, non-B agent, was small, somewhere between 30 and 60 nanometers, and lipid encapsulated. And that narrowed the diagnostic possibilities down to either one of the small RNA viruses, toga viruses, as, as they were called at the time, or uh, we had ruled out hepatitis B relationships, so it was either going to be a small RNA virus or a new viral class, and as you know, it turned out to be a flavivirus. Next, still unable to develop a test for this, although we tried very hard, uh, we went on to look at the clinical severity of non-A, non-B, performed 39 biopsies together with the liver unit at NIH, that, that time was led by Jay Hufnagel, uh, Adrian DiBuscelli, and we, uh, those 39 biopsies, we found that most were fairly mild, but 10% had cirrhosis and 13% had severe chronic active hepatitis, as it was called, that would progress to cirrhosis uh, ultimately. We did follow up biopsy on 20 of these cases, and while most appeared to be improved or stable, 25% uh, progressed to cirrhosis under observation. We wound up with eight of 20, eight of 39 or 20% who developed cirrhosis, a number that has really held up over the decades, although it may uh, exceed to 30%, 20 to 30%. Importantly, we showed that three of these eight patients died of liver failure, and another three had very severe liver disease when they died of the underlying heart disease. So we now knew we had not just a simple transaminitis as some suspected, but we had a serious chronic liver disease that could progress to cirrhosis and to liver-related uh, mortality. At this point, Michael Houghton and his associates at Chiron cloned the uh, non a non -B agent and renamed it hepatitis C virus to validate the assay they developed, an antibody assay, they asked for the so-called alter non-A, non-B panel. And 19 other laboratories had failed to break the code of this panel, but Chiron broke it perfectly. Uh, it was a small panel, but uh, everything was in present in duplicate. 
and the duplicates were in random positions. So they detected uh, three out of three patients with chronic non anon hepatitis in six random positions, two implicated blood donors in four random positions. They did not detect two patients with acute non anon B because they were testing for antibody and not virus, but rated these patients seroconverted for anti HCV. And importantly, they did not detect antibody in seven patients who had been well pedigreed to be safe blood donors. Uh, they did not find any sample positive in 14 different positions. Uh, so they had broken the code perfectly. We then went to our uh, 15 of our non-A, non-B cases and found 100% were antibody negative prior to transfusion and positive after transfusion. And then we looked at the donors to 25 such cases we found an anti-HCV positive donor uh, in 80% by a first generation assay and 88% by a second generation assay. So we can predict that introducing this test uh, would result in about a 90% reduction in post-transfusion hepatitis. Indeed, that's what happened. Looking on the right of this chart, you can see the first generation test was introduced in 1990 the second generation test in 1992. And after that, we saw no further cases of non-A, non-B or hepatitis C. By 1997, we had reached zero incidence. One could uh, extrapolate from the US population as a whole and guess that uh, in two decades from 1970 to 1990, that near 5 million patients were HCV infected from blood transfusion. And conversely, that after introducing the test in 1990, that 2.4 million transmissions were prevented uh, after this test was introduced. Now, I just want to jump from what we did to what might be the future and answer the question of whether HPV and HCV could be eradicated with or without a vaccine. Global eradication is what we seek. Is that possible? Well, it takes just one little step that I've called a miracle. Uh, but the miracle is conceivable because we now have universal, very effective vaccination for HPV, which each year is spread out to a greater and greater global population. We also have nucleoside and nucleotide inhibitors uh, that can reduce viral load to non-detectable and therefore reduce transmission. So with hepatitis B, it's quite conceivable that one could get uh, a vaccine-induced uh, eradication. For HCV, it's more difficult because we do not have a vaccine. Uh, but we do have very effective direct acting antivirals that can cure 95 to 100% of patients. So our job is to detect almost all HCV car carriers through massive global screening. This is difficult, but doable. Then we have to deliver simultaneously uh, these direct acting antivirals uh, that would penetrate at least 90% of each population. I can conceive then of having a rapid uh, HCV assay that could be used in the field and immediately uh, those who are positive could be given their first months of medication. Um, and with that scheme, uh, one could slowly over decades eradicate this infection, even without a vaccine, although vaccine would be the ideal. So what we need to achieve this uh, is not better tests, not better drugs. We just need the political, the corporate, the philanthropic, and the moral will to make it happen. It's not easy, but it's possible. I've been asked um, to talk to young people and talk about the secrets of success. Um, this is not easy to do, uh, but there are a few um, things on my roadmap to success, which may help, may not, but 
The first thing is you have to work hard as if your career depended on it, because it does. Uh, almost everyone in science works hard. Uh, and when the day is done at work, they bring further work to home. It's no getting around that. I myself have always given 100% at work. It's just that it's had a peculiar distribution. Nonetheless, <laughs> in the long run, it has worked out. But today, Friday, is one of my worst days. The second point is to find a good mentor in a good laboratory, but a mentor who wants your mind uh, as well as your hands, someone who seeks your advancement. It is critically important. You can't start out at the top. You have to start out under some leadership, uh, some program that's already established. And these mentors are incredibly important. Then you find your own niche over time. You have to be collaborative. Collaboration is essential. And I found that good collaborators serve as additional mentors. And I think I've learned more from my collaborators, particularly Bob Purcell, than I've learned from anyone else. But you just can't go alone anymore. Science is too complicated and you need help from other laboratories. Lastly, be observant and be persistent. When you see something, follow that unanswered question to its logical end or until you find there really is no logic to the pursuit. I've been very fortunate. I learned this lesson from Barry Blumberg after we, he found the, uh, we found the Australia antigen. And it took six years from the finding of the Australia antigen until the Blumberg group established that it was the surface antigen of the hepatitis B virus. It took near 20 years the initial discovery of non-A, non-B hepatitis until there was a test and later, uh, and later drugs. So this was a very long pursuit that I'm summarizing in 10 minutes or so. Um, but it's important. Lastly, there are many steps to success, successful research, but nothing happens if you don't take the first step. Don't be afraid to jump in and start a project and don't be afraid to stick with it, persist with it until you've answered the question or you know you can't. I wanna end with a poem, well, a poem about success that I have not written, I wish I had, it was written by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he said, success is to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people, to earn the appreciation of honest critics, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. That is to has, have succeeded. So thank you and thank you, Michael Houghton and Charlie Rice for taking these initial discoveries and bringing them to the point of cloning and testing and drug development. It's been a, a really wonderful story uh, to have participated in. Thank you.